All right. There. I'm sure that thumbs up already. I don't even know why I'm asking. He's quicker than I. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Church, as always, it's a blessing to be here with you. And as always, for those of you that join us online, I really wish that we could spend this time together in person. And I know for a lot of you it's not possible. So we thank God that even though we might never get to meet you on this side of this earth, we know because of what Jesus has done, we'll be together for eternity in heaven. Amen? Now church, last week we heard the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on Mount. And we were asked some questions that were meant to get us to stop and evaluate our lives and our walk with the Lord. One of those questions, if you remember, we were asked, what is our faith based off of? Is it based off of vicious wolves in sheep's clothing and what they told you about God? Or is it based on true biblical faith from God Himself? Now church, this is a very important question that we need to ask ourselves. Because the truth is, Jesus has already told us that our faith can be far better and greater and stronger than it is today. I know that's kind of hard to swallow. It might even sound insulting a little bit, but it's not meant to. The truth is, when Jesus was telling us about storing up treasures in heaven, and not to worry about what we'll eat, drink, or wear, Jesus said, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. If God cares so wonderfully for these wild flowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. And then Jesus openly declares, why do you have so little faith? Now before we go any further, we need to really stop. We need to stop and look at what is faith? Right? What is it? It's a word that we hear a lot, but what does it mean? Because the world has a lot of answers for this question of what is faith? But the truth is the only answer we need is the biblical answer, right? Right? So what is faith? Now as we continue to follow the life of Christ here on earth, we're going to find that last week was the first time that Jesus addresses our lack of faith. And here's the thing, it won't be the last time either. So church, the question of the day of what is faith is a very valid question. And today we're going to be looking at the difference between having a little faith and a lot of faith. Now often I've heard people in the world, and even in church, say that faith is simply believing in God. Which sounds good and all, doesn't it? But really that's an unbiblical lie. In James chapter 2, we find the truth that tells us, you say you have faith, for you believe there's one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Listen, church, demons, the man of lawlessness, and even Satan believe that God is real. And they even know more about God than most people do. But they do not have faith in God at all. And unfortunately, one of the devil's biggest deceptions is to get man to think that their belief in God is actually their faith in God when all along putting their faith and trust in the schemes of the devil. This is what we heard last week, remember? Last week we heard the work of Satan is with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. Now as we know, chronologically speaking, Jesus just finished up up giving us His Sermon on the Mount, right? And in that sermon, we heard Jesus teach us that we need to have a different kind of attitude. 
that our character and our internal qualities should be different than the rest of this world. If you remember, Jesus focused on teaching us that the inner qualities and character traits that align with God and His Word. We found Jesus warning us that we need to watch out and to not be hypocrites in the way we express our faith along with our desires for our mere human concerns. Then, of course, Jesus gave us the sound instructions on how we should express our faith in a way that honors and brings glory to God. Then as Jesus concluded His sermon, we found Jesus teaching us once again that genuine faith and righteousness are not just a matter of words but they are actions and attitudes demonstrated through one's life. And that is the Sermon in the Mount in its simplest form. And now, the next testimony in the life of Jesus is found in Luke chapter 7. When Jesus had finished saying all this on the Sermon on the Mount, to the people who were listening, He entered with them Capernaum. There a centurion servant whom his master valued was highly sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves for you to do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. And He was not far from the house when the centurion sent his friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble Yourself, for I do not deserve to have You come under My roof. That is why I did not even consider Myself worthy to come to You. But say the Word, and My servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turned to the crowd that was following him. Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And the men who had been sent returned to their house and found the servant well. Listen, church, we just came from Jesus on a mountain and He says, why do you have so little faith? And here, He's saying to this Roman centurion that He had such great faith that even Jesus has not seen this faith in Israel before. So if we have little faith, and this testimony tells us that the centurion had great faith, we need to find the difference, do we not? There are many, many examples that we can learn from in this testimony. And today we're going to be looking at a few of those examples. Now to start, we know that Jesus, like I said, just finished up His sermon. And he just came down the mountain and and entered Capernaum. And we heard that there, a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. Now right off the bat, God is telling us that there is something different about this centurion. You see, a centurion, if you didn't know this, was a commanding officer in the Roman army. But they weren't any old officer as we military personnel personnel know officers. You see, centurions were officers that would fight on the battlefield with their troops. In fact, they would be in the first row of troops to fight. And because of this, their pay wage was quite substantial compared to an officer that did not engage in battle. So that tells us that this centurion not only was a man of high authority and position, but he was also very wealthy. 
And not only did he have power and wealth, but if you know something about war, you would know that men on the battlefield are really brutal, violent animals with really no concern for anyone else's life other than those in his ranks. And that's on top. That's on top of the regular old brutal Roman heart. Listen, history itself shows that to the Roman, an animal held more value than a slave. And in the original translation, that's what the word they used was slave. In the book of Ethics, we've all heard of the great Aristotle, right? We've all heard of that guy. He wrote the book of Ethics for the Roman nation. And he said that there could be no friendship and no justice towards inanimate things. Not even towards a horse, an ox, or a slave. This great Aristotle said that a slave is just a living tool, just as a tool is an inanimate slave. Gaius was another guy who wrote part of the Roman law. And he's somebody who the Apostle Paul personally met in person. And in the law, he wrote that it's universally accepted that the master possessed the power of life and death over his slave. Varro was another highly renowned Roman. And he said the only difference between a slave, a beast, and a cart was that a slave could talk. And now, we find this powerful, wealthy, battle-hearted Roman centurion that has true compassion for even his slave. Now this centurion is quite different than the rest of Rome, isn't he? But the question is, how different is he from how we treat people? The slave, as Aristotle put it, was an inanimate object who by Roman law had no legal rights, not even to his own body. And he was sick and dying. Now do you realize that this centurion could have put down his servant just like he would have put down a dying horse? And despite what the world would do, and despite even what the Roman law said was legal, we find this Roman centurion highly valued his servant who was sick about to die. I mean, at church, is that not? Is that not what we just heard Jesus tell us on the Sermon on the Mount? He said it doesn't matter what we've heard. It doesn't matter what the law says. Right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he tells us. And while this servant wasn't the centurion's enemy, by all world standards and by Roman law, the servant was a piece of property. And the only difference between this piece of property that was sick and dying and one that was still useful to the Roman was that this one could talk. But the centurion, the centurion highly valued his servant. Listen, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3-5 through five tell us that we, we followers, followers of Christ, are to do nothing, do nothing, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And that church, that is the first thing that we can learn from this Roman centurion who Jesus said had great faith. Value others. Value others above yourselves by having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Listen, this centurion certainly demonstrated that truth. 
In fact, he valued his servant so much that verses 3-6 through six tell us that the centurion... Next one, Todd. It's alright, brother. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of the elders of the Jews to ask Him to come and heal His servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with Him, saying that this man deserves you to do this, because He loves our nation and He had built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Now listen, here's another history lesson. Most of us don't realize this, but at this time, in this centurion's life, Rome itself had about 67 gods. And that doesn't include their 12 main demigods. And in the midst, in the midst of this heathen nation, we find a Roman official who not only chose not to follow along with Roman laws, but we found him also not going to any of the 79 or so gods of his own people. But instead, the centurion that heard of Jesus, this Jewish man, he went to him instead, asking him to come heal his servant. Now listen, anybody that's been in the military knows, especially a military officer, in foreign land, it would take great faith to trust these people that I'm here to govern. Right? I'm here telling them how they should live their lives. Do you think they're probably going to tell me what's right or what's wrong? I know I lived in that life kind of for a while in Afghanistan. It was very hard to trust any of those people because some of us didn't, didn't want us there. But this centurion, he did trust the people with the things that he heard about Jesus. And not only did it take great faith to put trust into Jesus, it also took great humility It took great humility to say, listen, my 79 gods, they ain't doing it. They're not helping me. My friend that I care about is still sick and dying. So I'm going to go see this Jewish guy that I've heard about. This Jesus. And I, I, this powerful, wealthy Roman centurion, is going to plead earnestly with Jesus and beg Him to come heal my servant. Now church, we all know that Proverbs 3, verse 5 tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on on your own understanding, right? Listen, the centurion heard of Jesus. Heard of Jesus. And came and asked Him to heal his servant. This shows us that he trusted Jesus with the life of someone that he truly valued and loved. And not only that, but it shows us that he did not lean on all the nonsense, understanding, and false gods that Rome and the rest of this world offered him. And that church is the second way we can learn so that we could too can have this great faith like the centurion. And that's by trusting in the Lord with all your heart and leaning not on your own understanding. Now as we move into verses 6-8, through we find it tells us that Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to Him, Lord, don't trouble Yourself, for I do not deserve to have You come under My roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go and he goes. I tell this one to come and he comes. I say to my servants, do this. And he does it. This is another very interesting passage of Scripture here from a military standpoint. You see, from a military standpoint, you would never want to admit that anyone else is more superior than you in any way. And a Roman centurion officer would surely know this. Yet this man uses the words, Lord, I do not deserve, and I am not worthy. 
I mean, if any statement ever made by man was true, that is definitely it. Now, although the centurion didn't fully know who this man is, he heard things about Jesus that pointed him to the truth. I mean, this man obviously loved the Jewish nation. He invested in God's kingdom. And I'm sure with his dealings with the Jews, he heard a lot of truths about God. Truths like Psalm 107.20 that tells us God sent out His Word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. And the centurion fully believed. He fully believed this. He fully believed that Jesus not only has the power to save His friend, but He also knows and believes that this power that Jesus has is one that supersedes the ability of man, the things of this world, and even His Roman gods. That's why He says to Jesus, just say the word. Just say it and my servant will be healed. Truthfully, the centurion really didn't know much about Jesus at all. But he knew the truth. He knew the truth that he heard about Jesus. And that truth revealed to him that this Jesus is the real deal. That's why in verse 8, he says, he says to Jesus, For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and I tell this one come and he comes. I say to my servants, do this, and he does it. And just as this centurion was a man of high authority and great power, he knew that his power only came from being under Roman authority. And likewise, likewise, but more so, the centurion, with the utmost respect, in a manner that he knew he did not deserve and was not worthy of, compared his life and position to that of the life of Christ. In layman's terms, the centurion knew that the power that Jesus has must have come from the one true God. And if that power was God's power, then that would mean that this man Jesus would have been sent by God Himself. And the centurion showed great faith in Jesus. And he understood that Jesus could heal His friend just by His words because of the authority that God had given to Jesus when God dispatched Jesus to this earth. And he knew this deep down. Because he knew that God sent forth His Word to heal all mankind. And we find this centurion, this centurion without too much scriptural knowledge, without needing or asking for proof, without saying, physician, first heal yourself. He knew with all his heart that Jesus was the one that God had sent. And that church is the third way we can have great faith like this Roman centurion. Right, Todd? Proverbs 3, 6 tells us, in all your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. And here, in this testimony of the centurion, we see that in every way he submitted himself to Jesus. I mean, to start, he valued the life of his servant more than his own. And he trusted his friend's life in the hands of Jesus. As a man and a Roman centurion, he humbled himself by seeking Jesus. And that's when he had all these other gods he could have gone to. But instead, he came to Jesus and begged Jesus to heal his friend. As a powerful centurion officer in the Roman army, he submitted to Jesus by calling Him Lord and saying, I do not deserve and I am not worthy of being in your presence. 
And this is because He knew that Jesus was sent with the authority from the one true God. And because of this, verse 9 tells us, when Jesus heard this, He was amazed. And turning to the crowd that followed Him, Jesus said, I tell you, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel that the men who had been sent returned and they got to the house and found that the servant was well. Church, all I can say is listen clearly to what God is telling us here. And I say us because for us this is another one of those beneficial blessings that God is giving us by giving us the opportunity to look at Christ's life in a chronological order. You see, we know that Jesus just came down from the mountain. And one of the last things that Jesus told us is not everyone. Right? One of the last things Jesus told us, Todd, is not everyone who calls out to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the Kingdom of Heaven. Only those who actually do the will of My Father in Heaven will enter. On Judgment Day, many will say to Me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in Your name, cast out demons in Your name, and we performed many miracles in Your name. But Jesus says, I will reply that I never knew You. Get away from Me, You who break God's laws. Listen, church, when we talk about this man, Jesus, we are literally talking about the one and the only one that God has sent to be the author and finisher of our faith. As we will hear Jesus tell us later on, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to Him. Listen, church, Jesus is the authority over heaven and earth. We know that in the beginning was the Word that was Jesus. And the Word, Jesus, was with God. And the Word was God. He, Jesus, was with God in the beginning. We know that through Him all things were made. And without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Jesus' life. And that life is the light of all mankind. And the centurion, he recognized this in Jesus. And that's why he said, just say the Word and my servant will be healed. So church, let's go back to the question of the day. And that is, what is faith? Because now we know faith. Faith is not simply believing that God is real. Now to sum up the matter of what we just heard about the great faith of the Roman centurion and the little faith of Israel and even of those of us who follow Christ, In James chapter 2, there's a passage of Scripture. And when we compare this truth to the great faith of the centurion, we find that it continues to expand on what Jesus is telling us about great faith versus little faith. James chapter 2 tells us what good is it? What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? See, you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now some may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have any good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith. For you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. 
How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham, he was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened. Just as the Scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid the messengers and sent them away safely down a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Listen, church. Church, we often compare. And unfortunately, we compress our belief in God with our faith in God. And that should never be. As James said, you say you have faith because you believe there's one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish is that? Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Listen, church, Abraham didn't believe that God is real. Abraham knew that God is real. And Abraham believed the promises of God. And he put his faith in what God told him to do. Now listen, in no way, shape, or form do any of our actions here on earth have anything to do with our salvation. We know this, right? Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can, be, no one can boast. Listen, church, there is nothing, there is nothing we ever did to contribute to our salvation other than create the need for us to be saved. Midweek, Midweek, we know this. We know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 goes on to tell us, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. You see, faith by itself isn't enough. God has work for us in Christ Jesus to do. And unless the faith we have produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. How can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Listen, our good deeds, our good deeds never contribute anything to our salvation. However, the good deeds that come from us are a result of 
a, 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 a result and our evidence of our salvation. And when the Bible says good deeds, they're not referring to the actions that we have. The actions of holding the door open for some sweet old lady while slamming that same door in our enemy's face. Right? Where's the faith in that? The only good deeds that we can possibly have come from the obedience to Christ and Christ alone. So church, as we come to a close, we can safely say with certainty that the testimony of the Roman centurion and the teaching in James chapter 2 shows us the important lesson about having faith and action. You see, faith by itself isn't good enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and it is useless. And we've seen, we've seen that this centurion had great faith because of his actions. The centurion believed Jesus was the one to heal his servant. So he came to Jesus begging Him with a humble and respectful heart, acknowledging Jesus' authority and demonstrating trust in Jesus' power. We've seen the Roman centurion's great faith in action through his selfless concern for even his slave. The centurion believed Jesus' abilities to heal and his actions aligned with his faith as he begged Jesus to help. Listen, God teaches us that faith without works is dead. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe that, then I would have to say, why do you have such little faith in what God clearly tells us in His Word? I mean, we just heard God emphasize to us that genuine faith should be evident through His good deeds lived out in our lives. God commands us to live out our faith in practical ways so that others may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. And that, that's the kind of faith that leads people to salvation. Truthfully, in all essence, we find Jesus doing exactly what He preached to us to do on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is literally putting faith into action. Listen, the truth is, faith and works go hand in hand. And true faith is validated by godly, obedient actions that reflect it. Looking at these two passages of Scripture together today, we find that the Roman centurion's testimony illustrates the principal truth that true faith is not just a matter of belief in one's mind, but also, and more so, true faith is a matter of actions that flow from one's heart based on the truths about God. As we know, because Jesus has warned us already, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. None of us, not one person on this earth, can serve two masters. The centurion's faith was showing through his humility, respect, his trust, his obedience, and his concern for even his servant. And his actions aligned with his belief. Just as James teaches us that real faith should manifest itself in deeds, in good deeds, in Christ's deeds. Listen, church, the centurion's testimony along with James's teaching, it shows us that faith is a living thing. It's an active force. It's something that transforms our lives and it leads us and gives us the ability to love even our enemies and value others' lives above our own. Amen, brother. True, genuine faith 
is not only believing everything that God says, but it's also being obedient to everything that God says. And having that kind of faith leads to a life that is characterized and full of good deeds, compassion, and selflessness. Just as we see in Centurion's testimony, live out that same kind of life. Now as Jesus clearly has said, there are some that have little faith, and there are those who have great faith. And here today, we have clearly seen three simple keys to having great faith. The first is, value others and their needs above yourselves by having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The second key is simple. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And the third key is, in all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. 79. 79. 79 plus gods that this centurion could have chose to seek help from. But instead he came to Jesus and Jesus made his path straight. Listen, people who have great faith are simply people who act on the truths and promises that most people choose not to. Yes, there are truths in Scripture that are hard to believe. But we believe them because we know this is what God says. And then with great faith, we humble ourselves and we trust God and we stand on the truths that He tells us. And then we put our faith into action when needed. So church, let me ask you, what is it that you're not believing about God? What is it that's causing you to have such little faith? It's a valid question. It's a very valid question. You know, almost every week since we've been looking at Christ's life in a chronological order, and this is almost seven months now, so almost every week somebody comes up and says, wow, I feel like that sermon was just written just for me. I feel like you actually knew what I was going through. And I would always tell you, as I've told every one of you, it just God so happened that chronologically this is the message that we find in Christ's life today. Amen. So church, where's your faith at? What's going on in your life that you need to increase that faith with by valuing others and their needs above your own? by having that same mindset as Christ Jesus, by trusting in the Lord with all your heart and leaning not on your own understanding, in all your ways submitting to Him, you do that and He will make your path straight. Listen, I don't know what it is, what it is that's causing you not to put your faith into action, but you do. And more importantly, God does. So church, as we close, this is your time. This is your time to come to the Lord with what you heard and come to Him and ask Him to forgive you for for being sorry or forgive you for your lack of faith. Seriously, come to God with a humble and respectful heart knowing that you do not deserve and you are not worthy to be in His presence. But because of God's great love for us, He allows us to. Ask God. Ask Him to show you where you need to trust Him more. And once He shows you, because He will show you, so once He does, put your faith into action and do what God tells you to do. Amen? Amen. Now like I said a few weeks ago, church, you don't have to come to the altar to do your business with God. God knows your bodies, right? He knows your limitations. You can stay right where you're at. There's nothing magical about coming from here to there. Right? doesn't make a difference, does it? We do our business with God where we're at, right? 
Now, there's nothing wrong with coming to the altar, especially if you want to pray with somebody. I'm not against that in any way, shape, or form. But what I'm saying is, God knows you. He knows exactly where you're at right now. He's given us this message today for a reason. Because He wants all of us, not just you, not just me, not just Andy, He wants all of us to have a greater faith than we did today and yesterday and the day before. And He's given us the ability to do so. All we have to do is trust in what He tells us through His Word. It's that simple, isn't it? So, church, this is your time. I'm going to close this out in prayer. And as I close this out in prayer, if you know deep down in your heart there's something that you haven't been trusting God about, this is your time to come to Him in your own prayers with Him and ask Him to forgive you and ask Him to help you build that faith. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank You, Lord. As always, I will say it till the day I die. Thank You, Lord, not just for the gift of salvation, as wonderful as it is, and it's the, most, it's the thing we needed the most. You've given us more gifts than salvation. You've given us purpose. As You say, Lord, You've come here to give us life and life to the fullest. And Lord, when we live that life with You, when we set aside our flesh, when we become that living sacrifice, when we truly value others above ourselves, we get to experience that life that You have for us. So Lord, I thank You, Father, for giving us the gift of Your Holy Spirit that leads us to all truth. I thank You, Father, that in the midst of whether we go to the left or whether we go to the right, Your gentle, still voice is always there telling us this is the way to go. Father, You know more than anyone that we were like ignorant, ungrateful, children at times. We say, no, we don't want that. God, my whole life I've been telling you no. So I know this better than anyone else. And despite how many times we say no, you say, I don't care. You are my handiwork that I created through my Son. And I did that for good works that you have to do and that I've planned for you to do in advance. And Lord, I know more than anybody, I have not lived up to all the good works that You've asked me to do. And I'm sure my brothers and sisters haven't either. And I thank You for forgiving us, Lord, that we cannot always be who You call us to be. And I thank You that Your patience, Your love, Your grace, and Your mercy, and Your unfailing love will be here with us forever. But Lord, don't let us just live in that love. Discipline us when You have to so that we can get up out of our seats, and we could be the men and women that You called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give You thanks for all that You've done, not just for us, but for all mankind. Amen. Now church, Barry, you could stop the video. Church, I love you all. I'm sorry I got...